Well, I'm now being joined by Timitokbe Olodo, a preventive terrorism consultant, to speak more on the federal government uh, list of terrorism financiers. Thank you for your time, Mr. Olodo. Now, what do you make of the list unveiled by the NFIU and some of the names mentioned there, like that of Tuko Mamo, Mamu, who was a negotiator in a number of kidnapping incidents in the north? Um, thank you so much for having me in the first instance. Uh, for many of us that work within this cycle, we are not quite surprised by the uh, list. I, I think it's important to, you know, remind your your viewers that about three years ago, the government came out. You know, the government or the former Info information minister, Lai Mohammed, came out to say there were 96 financiers that they have identified. And we know that the former attorney general on more than three occasions have highlighted that there are people out there that be financing terrorism and that the names will be re you know, released you know, quite soon. And this particular organization, the NFIU, have actually come out on many occasions, especially between 2020 and 2021, to highlight that there were 96 financial organizations, there are 400 and 424 companies, 15 bureau de change, and 45 organizations uh, of individuals that are going through prosecution. Up to date, we have not seen the outcome of those prosecution, nor have we had anything about it. So this is not quite surprising because the individual in question was well known to the security services and have been involved in all this kind of engagement. But um, why I'm a bit surprised is I still going to the legal court and is not yet been convicted. Until he's been convicted, uh, I will not join others in you know you know tarnishing his image to say that he is you know a terrorist or a terrorist fiance because we know that a former uh, commissioner of police. Um, Emmanuel Ojuku once said that there's a lot of fifth communists within the government who are involved in these activities, and there's a lot of uh, you know, what we call conflict entrepreneurs running around Nigeria, and we've not seen anything done to them. Even Dubai, you know, uh, UEA had actually come out with names of company, you know, below the chain that have been involved in terrorism and not have actually happened in Nigeria. Most of them were actually picked up by, you know, the uh, UEA. So for Nigeria to be coming up now saying they've got 15 uh, below the chain that they are blacklisting, when they did mention in 2021 that they were 96, I want to know how come the 15 have been, the 96 have been reduced to 15. All right, now, terrorist groups have so far wrecked incalculable uh, havoc on Nigeria and its citizens. Now, do you agree with the move by the federal government rehabilitating and reabsorbing the so-called repentant terrorists back into the society? I have no problem with deradicalization because I'm one of the chief advocates for deradicalization. I did work in, a, in the Office for Security and Counterterrorism in the UK, and that context strategy more or less talks about the prevent strategy, which is the radicalization. But I am not quite comfortable with the Nigerian approach to the radicalization. The reason being that the de radicalization is a project which is more or less done in secrecy and in which the military are the, the Alpha and Omega. So the military identify the people that are terrorists the military are the ones that will identify people that need to be de-radicalized. The military will be the same people that will de-radicalize them, and the military will be the ones that release them. I feel that you know the de-radicalization by the military for the military by the military does not work for me. It needs to be people-driven. It needs to be community-driven. Because if those individuals need to be released into the community, then you need to get the community involved. And since Nigerian government have been involved in de-radicalization, how many success stories have we had? How many individuals have come on TV to say, yes, I was once a terrorist, now I am not a terrorist anymore, and I recruit about 5, 10, 15 people, I'm a valuable citizen of Nigeria. We've not seen that. 
We don't even know what their curriculums are. I had a budget of over three million where I was giving it out, you know, to community leaders. There were community organizations registered that were doing those deradicalizations and helping to ensure the UK is a safe place. That is not the case with the Nigerian project. And in a, in a situation where the military is coming out to say 51,000 people have been there, have come out to surrender and they have been deradicalized. But it has never happened anywhere in the world. So Nigeria is the first thing of its kind to be deradicalizing such a huge number. And I wait to see, you know, if they could release the numbers, the budget, the fee. Now, I know the Tunubu government is running a transparent um, system. So I'm hoping the ministry will come out and give us, their, open up their books to tell us how much is their budget for deradicalization? Who are the organizations that are actually doing this deradicalization? How many of those individuals have been releasing to the public? And what is the statistics with regard to their return back to terrorism? So those are the kind of things that will give Nigerians confidence that the system is working. But when the military are the ones picking people, the same military are the ones deradicalizing people, for me, it does not work. Deradicalization does not work in that way. And I know at least a lot about it because I work in that system. Even before the issue of deradicalization became a household name in Nigeria, I've been working in that field. All right, now to be talking about a little preventive terrorism consultant. Thank you very much for your insights.